It's that time. Your fix is here. College football is a year-round discussion with these two. Here's J.C. and Morgan. Mike Morgan of ESPN and J.C. Sherbert of 24-7 Sports have you covered. Beginning right now. And welcome aboard, everybody. It is another installment of J.C. and Morgan. Happy post-tax day. Uh, the, the it's day actually that, yeah. wear your pajamas to work day, Mike. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, you should. Be, and be Eggs Benedict that. Day. Eggs Benedict Day. I'm not an Eggs Benedict guy. so I'm not an Eggs guy, period. So that does nothing for me. What was ye- yesterday was a landmark day. It wasn't just national tax day it was something else it's it was, a titanic uh, remembrance titanic day. remembrance day and i can get behind that you know i can get behind that that's a that's a ben franklin i, I whenever the movie's on you know what it is with me i, I figured this out and, and now jaws stands you know how i feel about jaws i mean it's 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 right there with the godfather and shawshank the holy trilogy of classic movies, but part of the appeal for Jaws and Titanic, I'll even watch Jaws two when it's on. It's not a great movie, but I'm a water baby. You put a you put a two star movie, and the majority of it takes place on an ocean, and I'm probably going to watch. So that helps. You put it on an ocean, you put it on a lake, and and all of a sudden a two star could go to a three star. A three star could go to a four star. Jaws is already a four star. You just you don't have enough stars when you add that plot, that that cast, with they filmed it in um, Nantucket, I believe, over by the Cape. But but yeah, I mean that's you, or maybe it was Martha's Vineyard. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. So yeah, uh, the so, Titanic. Do I love the movie? Eh, it's you know kind of a hokey love story, but it's. I love the ship on the water for the majority of the movie. So you're telling me that weekend at Bernie's is probably up there with you along with nights at Rodanthe. Well, I never saw that. I'm not even sure what that Ah, is, but we can Richard gear. I think it's Richard gear. And it's that there's a song by Gavin Rossdale from Bush. That's kind of the lead. It's a Richard Gere romance drama. Okay. Like, hey, I love you. Uh, you know, you know like found his, they're heartbroken older people and they find love. Uh, it sucks. I've never, I've only seen it one time. I've never time. heard of that. And I, I think Richard and, Gere brings it. Like he's, but it's set on the beach, Mike. 
Settle the beach. Well, then, then I'd give it a shot. Yeah, and Weekend at Bernie's. I mean, it's a silly, hokey movie. Um, and I, long before our current president, I used to make jokes about certain coaches that if they looked lifeless and what have you, I'd make the joke that that's Weekend at Bernie's. That was like a funny line that I had in the 90s and early 2000s. It's still being used today. Like Weekend at Bernie's is part of the vernacular when somebody wants to describe somebody who has a job but is is clearly like overwhelmed and not really doing anything um weekend at bernie's is still referenced in that and that's like a it's a cheesy 80s movie but yeah the fact that it's set on this like multi-million dollar mansion that bernie owned on the ocean yeah that helps i might give it two and a half stars at that point yeah water water does amazing things for me uh 90210 and that was a cheesy show I saw every episode and a lot of those episodes, you know, it's sunny California and it's near the beach and sometimes it's on the beach. And I mean, who could forget the love triangle, Brandon Walsh, Dylan McKay, Brenda. I mean, these are who could forget the dance moves of David Silver. I mean, that guy, that's the Fred Astaire of our time. But uh, anyway, I digress. We, <laughs> we got a lot to get wow. to today. Uh, we'll get to the JC five, which, I insisted we put something on there regarding ACC quarterbacks. I kind of stumbled upon this, JC. Uh, we talked a lot about SEC quarterbacks, and we'll continue to do so. Spring games are going on. They A number of them went on last Saturday. A number of them will go on this Saturday. I don't want to get too heavy into spring game analysis because the game itself, all you had to do is watch what, what Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss did, and it was, you know, it was Ringham and uh, Barnum and Bailey and, uh, you, you, you had everything but like Siegfried and Roy having a tiger go through a hoop of fire. You had uh, you had a dunk contest. You had Joey Chestnut eating hot dogs. You had um, seven on seven, no pads, just kind of flipping tires, like just silliness. And again, I'm not being critical when I say that. I I just think that's where we are. The spring game. Is no, it's it's not even an, it's not even a. I used to call it a glorified scrimmage. I wouldn't even call it that now. It's truly just an exhibition. It's the NBA All Star Game meets Midnight Madness. Uh, it it's just it's kind of it is what it is. But there still gives us an excuse to talk football, and we'll do that with uh, uh, Mike Griffith of uh, the AJC and Dognet. Mike covers more than just Georgia, and Mike, I I didn't know this until I saw you you come across uh you've crossed paths with mike for uh longer than i have jc i just met him a few months ago for the first time in person we we knew each other by proxy uh but i met him at the steve spurrier banquet a few months ago and um he actually emceed it but he's covered long before georgia alabama tennessee and i believe auburn and michigan state so he's been around the block but what I what many of our listeners and what I know him from the most is his appearances on Feinbaum. And he likes to needle people and and Feinbaum, they're like they're just like an old married couple when he's on there. And I find it entertaining. I actually find it pretty entertaining because he doesn't take himself too seriously. So he's willing to take the bows and arrows and and he does from SEC fans all over the country, particularly ones that are tired of seeing Georgia dominate. So Michael, come on and our and one, we won't just talk Georgia. We'll just, we'll talk a lot of big picture stuff as we have with Luganville and Staples and Pate and Dellinger and Wetzel and everybody else we've had on here for the last couple of months. Absolutely. And by the way, just a shameless plug here: you can find all of our past episodes on the Chief Sports app. You download that on Google Play for Android or on Apple Pod, uh, not podcast, but uh, you can get us on Apple Podcasts as well on the Apple yep. App Store for uh, iPad and iPhone. Also, YouTube.com slash Chief Sports South Carolina. That's uh, kind of where our YouTube home is. Uh, mm -hmm. Follow us on Instagram at JC and Morgan, and you can see some highlights from all these guys. The, the, yeah, the, the social media. Come on with us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of media like, clips have been on fire. Yeah. People love like YouTube shorts and Instagram reels and stuff. So we've, uh, for this show and every show across chief, really, we've gotten into that a little bit. And so, uh, do yourself a favor, give us some love, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, 
Go follow us on the Insta, and uh, you'll get just a little taste. It's like Baskin Robbins when you went in as a kid. You remember <laughs> you wanted the the sample? Yes. I want the sample. I always love that because some I could, people I'd abuse get three it. samples. Some I people abuse, abuse the system, samples. Obviously. There was a whole uh, Larry would, David I, episode on some woman who was sampling like twenty seven flavors, and she's like, "I'll I'll try the banana." And Larry David sitting there waiting in line, going, "Oh, banana! Jeez, well, I wonder what that could taste like. Could it be banana?" <laughs> And then she winds up ordering no mystery. Vanilla. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So, uh, yeah. But no, so I, yeah, I, uh, you deserve a, a lot of credit on that. The, the, the social media has been terrific. Um, uh, the, 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 eventually this will continue to grow. Uh, most of you still listen on Spotify and we, we love that, but I do encourage you to watch the YouTube version. The audio sometimes, believe it or not, is actually even a little bit better on YouTube, depending on, I don't, I can't explain all of it. Generational loss or whatever. Uh, but even if you're like, you know, Mike, I just like to listen when I'm at the gym or I'm driving the, the, the kids home from school. You don't have to watch us. You just listen on YouTube. I promise you, you won't lose anything. But if you want to actually see our guests or whatever, as we got stuff going on the screen or proud sponsors, what have you, some of the benefits uh, of that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'll add one thing on that note, Mike, sure. technically, because uh, on YouTube, sometimes I know if I'm in the car. There's like an ocean of music on YouTube that I love, but unless you subscribe to YouTube music or you're a premium subscriber to YouTube, that app has to stay open and all, and your phone has to stay like in not lock mode. So your phone can get hot. Well, we got it. We got it. We got to fix the chief sports app. will play the video stream seamlessly. You can oh, minimize okay. it. You can put, yeah, you could be at the gym and minimize it. You don't have to keep uh, opening your phone. Your phone won't get hot. That kind of thing. That's uh, and the video is right there. Uh, so Perfect. just wanted to kind of pass that along. So yeah, Chief Sports app for uh, Android and Apple. Uh, just go to those respective Google Play and also the App Store, and, and be sure to rate the app five stars for us, and uh, leave a little note there that Mike and I are good people. <laughs> if that means lying, do it because it helps us uh, continue. No, I I I think uh, I think if you got a chance to hang out with us, you'd have a good time, and you'd see we're we're. We're just co good common folk that just happen to do a popular podcast each and every week on the Chief Sports Network. And continuing to grow, uh, check out the website, jcnmorgan.com as well. We'll start putting more and more stuff on that and can take your emails on that as well. Uh, what I was saying before I went into uh, another corner of the atmosphere there is that uh, I stumbled upon something just looking at Quarter, you know, quarterback to me, uh, I mean, I think to everybody, but I, I really, when I start kind of whittling down what I'm looking for in expectations of every team in the sport, I, well, you start with the premier programs, the ones that predictably are in the playoff every year, and now even more predictably will be in a 12 team playoff. But I look at quarterback play, and we touched on some of the SEC, and then I started looking at the ACC, and I, I stumbled upon a revelation and the ACC quarterback crop. It's good. It's good. This is not a, Oh, well look, the SEC is better than the ACC conversation. Uh, JC and I noted years ago when the ACC was a 2016, when the ACC had a superior year uh, top to bottom in quarterback play, it happens every now and then last year that you could already argue the pack had the best year of, of quarterback play. Right. The, the, the now defunct pack, which you'll tell your grandchildren about, that there was this conference out west and they called themselves the the Pac-10 and the Pac-12. And it was a thing. Um, the ACC has some good quarterbacks, but there is a stark difference. One particular trait that I'll tell you about between the ACC quarterback stable and the SEC quarterback stable. That'll be part of the uh, JC5 when we uh, continue. In fact, let's go ahead and take a break now. So we don't, we don't have to go no huddle. We don't have to go tempo. You know, uh, we can huddle up. We can audible at the line of scrimmage. We can, we, 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 we can go ahead and run an old school offense and not one of these fancy. Everything is no huddle tempo. Quick, 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 quick. No time to make secondary reads. No time to do check down. No, 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 no. We're going to actually, we're going to go like 1990s ball here. JC5 coming at you. A quick timeout. JC and Morgan here on April the 16th. Back in just a minute. Down here in the South, 
We don't always see eye to eye. While our taste in college football teams, or what sauce, if any, goes best on a rack of ribs, or what to mix with our Dixie vodka might be up for debate, we can all agree there's nothing better than a Southern tailgate. And like our favorite college teams, our ingredients come from small towns and big cities. They're grown in Southern soil, are crafted by Southern hands, and proudly represent the South in our backyard and beyond. So raise a glass of Dixie Southern Vodka to celebrate being made in America and raised in the South. Hey folks, want to tell you about our friends at Titan Construction Group really quick. They're a mid-Atlantic-based general contractor, specializes in retail, restaurant, and office construction. TCG strives to separate itself from other general contractors by adding value every step of the process. From project budgeting to estimation, value engineering to construction, they focus on those relationships and not the transaction. Titan builds partnerships one project at a time. Among their clients are Starbucks, Crumble Cookie, uh, Blake Pizza, Home Goods, 15 plus years experience based in Midlothian, Virginia, and contracted in Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So get on their website, Titan cginc.com that's titancginc.com get in touch with brad if you're in need of a general contractor that focuses on going above and beyond for their clients that's titan construction group a proud sponsor of the jc and morgan podcast mike listen up this is for construction professionals contractors facility managers or do-it-yourself homeowners site pro rentals is ready to equip your upcoming project we rent construction equipment for any size job. Boom and scissor lifts, telehandlers, skid steers, excavators, air compressors, generators, even small tools and equipment. SitePro has you covered. If you are ready for better equipment rental, call SitePro and rent from the local, friendly, easy to do business with equipment professionals. Call 972 Rent Now. That's 972 736 8669 to rent the newest equipment in the Atlanta market. Call 972 Rent Now or visit SitePro. ProRentals.com. We're passionate about making sure that the Nest and Wild mattress is the best it can be. Made well and made right. Right here in Tupelo, Mississippi. So how can we do all that? Work. Hard work. And that means something. The Nest and Wild Mattress is a movement. It's a pride in where you come from and where you're going. So get comfortable. Because this movement is just beginning. It's time it, for the top topics in the sport. We bring the JC5. Number thank you, one. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Announcer. Always good to bring us back in. Again, JC and Morgan presented in part by Nest and Wild. Nestandwild.com, the most comfortable mattress you can possibly purchase. It's like sleeping on top of a cloud. Five layers. All the best in their new hybrid beds the high performance hybrid beds most comfortable mattress you'll sleep on but not priced that way straight out of tupelo mississippi brandon jameson the founder and ceo they have stumbled upon uh just an outstanding product and do terrific work and the best thing is it can be shipped to your door in just a couple of days you open up the box and boom you've got the great mattress i've had some of my best sleep in years Thanks to the fine folks at Nest and Wild. Check it out, nestandwild.com. Tell them you heard about it on JC and Morgan. Number one, Sherb Nation. All right. So you mentioned the ACC and the quarterbacks, and I think uh, what you're getting at is there's a lot of kind of journeymen uh, in the ACC. Now I'm looking at two off the top of my head. Max Johnson is on school number three. Supposed Mm -hmm. to be the starter at North Carolina this year. And DJ. Ungle a lie. I, I can never pronounce it. Uh, he's on school number three. Back to the league. 
right at Florida State. Now, will he will he win the job? They say he will. So, uh, after being at Clemson and then one year out at Oregon State. So, uh, to your point, Mike, what does uh, the crop of ACC quarterbacks in your eyes look like? Well, see, I mean, th- this to me is a great distinction. So, I was looking now, folks. Don't get all bent up been out of shape on the rankings again this is just a a couple that i read so like the sec if you were go top 10 it would look something like this carson beck quinn ewers jalen milrow jackson dart brady cook nico of tennessee uh nussmeyer wigman jackson arnold graham mertz those would be the top 10 uh you could expand it. Lenora Sellers, JC, I know a guy you're very high on, obviously going to be the guy at South Carolina, and they're extremely excited about his uh, skill and ability. But if you just look at those top 10, eight of those top 10 are homegrown products. The, the two exceptions, Jackson Dart, transfer from Southern Cal, and Graham Mertz, transfer from Wisconsin. And of course, they they've got their – they're, what they believe is their stud in DJ Lagway, but I don't think Lagway is going to – he's going to play. He's going to see the field, uh, but he's not going to win the job over Mertz. And obviously Jackson Dart's going to be the starter at Ole Miss. Eight out of those ten were recruited by the school that they're, they're at right now and are still playing. Never hit the portal. Eight out of ten. The ACC. Cam Ward, DJ Uyugulale, Haynes King, uh, Kyron Drones, Cade Klubnick, Kyle McCord, Grayson McCall, Preston Stone, Chandler Rogers, Malik Murphy. Eight of those 10 are transfers. Eight of those 10 are the only two, Klubnick from Clemson and Stone, who's a four-star kid out of Dallas for SMU. And that's right. Get used to it, folks. SMU is in the ACC. As weird as that sounds. It's true. We did some background on it. Uh, if you extend it, Tyler, Tyler Show, uh, Shall is it Show or Shall of Louisville? Uh, Thomas Castellanos of Boston College, Hank Bachmeyer of Wake, Max Johnson of North Carolina, and if you go all the way down to Pitt, Eli Holston, transfer from Alabama, thirteen. 13- Of the 17 projected ACC starting quarterbacks are portal guys, including the top four. Cam Ward on his third school, Washington State last year. I believe it was Incarnate Word before that, if I'm not mistaken. It was was a really small school. Is that right? Um, Uyugalale, everybody remembers him at Clemson. Didn't work out there. Goes to Oregon State. Has a renaissance. Oregon State now is in the abyss. And DJ says, I'm taking my talents to Tallahassee. Haynes King, who played well last year for Georgia Tech, played well. Uh, of course, Haynes started off at AM. That was a big get for, for Georgia Tech. Uh, Kyron Drones, Virginia Tech, he was at Baylor for two years. Kyle McCord, Syracuse, of course, he was at Ohio State. Grayson McCall, NC State, he was at Coastal Carolina. I mean, feels like he was there for about 11 years, as a matter of fact. Chandler Rogers. Of Cal, yes, Cal is in the ACC. Another one, kind of like putting on a pair of socks that you don't really think fit necessarily. Are they too high up in the calves? Are they too low to the ankles? Whatever, you're wearing them. You're wearing Cal in the ACC. Listen to this kid's uh, track record. Southern Miss, Blinn Junior College, the Blinn Buccaneers, that you might remember that's where Cam Newton went before he went to Auburn. And Louisiana Monroe and North Texas. He's on his fifth school. (laughs) He's a starter at Cal. And Malik Murphy at Duke. Hell of a get. Transfer from Texas. So not only 13 out of 17, but eight out of the top 10, JC, are portal guys. Now, I don't know what all that means, but I found it very interesting. I think college football, I had a discussion earlier today on 107.5 FM in Columbia, South Carolina, my weekly segment about this. 107. I, I think I, yeah, the game, the game is on. Anyway, the game is on. Sh- shout out to my boy Gunner. Um, I think this position in college football, 
I, you know, is it good or bad if you have a portal quarterback? I don't know. I, I think there's some data that shows it, it can go bad. I think Kentucky is kind of an example of that from last year because Devin Leary wasn't really himself uh, and really wasn't down the stretch at NC State either. Um, could it be good? Yeah, Oregon State appreciated DJ coming. You know, uh, look at the national champions that have won with transfer quarterbacks. I mean, you know, Joel Burrow, transfer quarterback, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Heisman winners that were transfer quarterbacks. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of 50, 50. Uh, and now you mentioned a lot of the studs coming back in the sec. But if you look toward the bottom of the sec quarterback rankings, Mississippi state transfer from Baylor, Arkansas transfer from Boise state, Vanderbilt mm -hmm. transfer from New Mexico state, uh, Preston from Auburn is a Michigan state transfer from last year. Mm -hmm. uh, even Quinn Ewers, I think you missed him technically is a transfer. Now he doesn't, it's tough to count him because he's a Texas kid was committed to Texas, but remember he signed with Ohio state and spent spring ball there. But never the played deal. there. Never right? played. Never. No, nah, he was, they went through spring practice immediately transferred back to Texas. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. But so, but he was so he's technically uh, he did get in the portal once. So okay, uh, the, I'm still going to call was, him a because he's, he's never a thrown a pass for anybody other than Texas. I'll say this though, too, well, to your point about the ACC, there are a lot of dudes that are on their like third, fourth, one guy with a fifth school. Yeah, I mean, you know, they are what you would call journeymen. <laughs> I mean, when, once you get past two, in my opinion, you're a journeyman. Uh, at no, least no for question. Now. Yeah, and I hope that's not a trend because I, I, you know, quarterbacks are going to go where they're going to play because you only, only can play one. But man, we start getting into three and four schools for some of these guys. It gets kind of ridiculous because uh, then I don't know they're transferring for good reasons. All right, let's go on to number two. Number two. All right, Arkansas made a big hire in basketball. Their baseball team is top two in the country. Their track field team is good. Um, expansion in the SEC. Now there's two different ways you could look at it. You can look at it and be like, oh my God, here comes Texas and Oklahoma. But you also could look at it as Arkansas's neighborhood, whereas when they first joined the league, they were sort of an outpost. It's now like the posh suburb, the, the, kind of <laughs> like maybe com coming Georgia, if you will, uh, because now you got Texas, Oklahoma right there. That I mean, they, they, A&M's there. Now, historically, they didn't play. They haven't played Oklahoma a lot. You got Missouri to the north. So you're going to have two forced border rivals with, uh, you know, and, and, and their entire state is now surrounded by the SEC. So the key to Arkansas football recruit Texas, does this help or hurt them? Because obviously Ooh. you're surrounded by programs that have more tradition, more winning. But back in the day, you competed against all these guys because you kind of had something in common with them. That's a great question. I never thought of that. And I – I think this is the only show you'll ever hear. You used coming. I'll use Alpharetta. <laughs> Fayetteville, the Alpharetta of the SEC. Um, if you've ever been to those two towns, slightly different. Um, I think it hurts. I hate to say this, Arkansas fans. I'm, you know, I'm pulling for you. Great people there. Great fans. I've enjoyed my many visits to Fayetteville. I look forward to many more um, other than getting there. But. Yeah, I, I just think if you look at the history of Arkansas, when they're at their best, they're getting really good talent from Texas and Oklahoma. And they could sell to those kids, we are the gateway to the SEC. You don't get that with Texas and Oklahoma. Much like Kentucky sells kids from the Midwest, and we are the gateway to the SEC. You, you, you're a northern guy. Uh, you're a northern young man, and, and you don't want to go too far south with all them southern folk. You want to go ahead and be close to mom and dad, but you're still playing in the best conference on the planet. That's what Arkansas has been able to sell. And now that sales pitch has been like a watered down bourbon. You just added more ice cubes to it <clears throat> sitting there over time. And I don't think that sales pitch is as strong. I think, I think Arkansas is, they're in a pickle geographically. There are some schools, you know, sometimes JC, when I look at it, uh, and, and how some schools are so good over time and some just are perpetually in the abyss. I, I, I point back to geography more often than not. I mean, geography is such an either advantage or disadvantage where you're located, 
in terms of recruiting, in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, recruiting is the number one by far, but also living in a desirable place. I mean, kids want to go to a place they think is will, will be a fun time to spend four and a half years. Now, you can turn a, a crap hole city into a great college town. I'm not going to name names here, but some schools have been able to do that. But uh, geography is huge. And I think right now, uh, geographically speaking, Arkansas is up against it. So I would say it's a bad thing. Yeah, before we go through, yeah, you're right. I mean, like the outliers are like places like Oklahoma, uh, not a big population state. They're really good. You know, Tennessee, uh, although Tennessee's growing as a state, and pretty soon they're going to be able to rely on in-state talent. Um, I'd even I think argue Alabama to a certain extent because it's a smaller state and they split up players. It's a state with mm-hmm. less than five million people. Um, but yeah, that's why Indiana is not very good at football. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's no there's nobody there. I mean, there's no players there. So uh, that's why Kentucky Kentucky has a ceiling. I think Mark Stoops yeah. has done a miraculous job there, but I don't know if they can go much higher than that because yeah. Kentucky yeah. annually turns out some of the lowest numbers with like four or five star prospects. I'm speaking your language now, JC. Mm-hmm. And so they they have to be creative in recruiting. Alabama. Even if Alabama doesn't, Alabama is such a blue blood that doesn't matter where that you you know you could put Tuscaloosa uh, in Juarez and they're still going to get a bunch of blue chip kids because it's Alabama. But Arkansas doesn't have that cachet, and Kentucky doesn't have that cachet. So the, it, it, those those differences are distinct ones. Yeah, also helps having the state to yourself, like LSU. Sure. Louisiana's population is lower than Kentucky's. Kentucky's got more people than Louisiana. However, number one, there's a lot more football players in Louisiana percentage wise and in Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky's kind of a basketball spot, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. And so that, that kind of, that kind of plays a factor as well. If you have, if you don't have to split the talent in your state. Number three. All right. So I see all these coach rankings now it's list season. We know it's list yep. season. Uh, Dan Lanning, apparently everybody loves him. Um, and look, I I like the guy too. I'm not, I'm not trying to come down on Dan Lanning, but when you do big 10 coaching rankings and he's sitting there at third and he's over guys like James Franklin and Brett Bielema and some guys that have actually won things, Rose bowls, uh, won at Vanderbilt have been good for a long time. It sort of gives me pause again. What does this guy want? Right? What does he actually want? Oh, he recruits really well. Great, great. And how many times has he lost to Utah? I mean, it's it's Oregon. It's already a great job. You know, he's not building anything. You're not reinventing the wheel out there. So tell me, Mike, would you have Dan Lanning ranked third in the Big Ten coaching wise? Some some polls have him second behind uh, Ryan Day. Who did Dan Lanning take over for? Mario Cristobal. And who did he take over for? Shotgun Willie Taggart. Willie Taggart. So th- thanks to w- – everybody looks a little bit better at their job when you follow Willie Taggart. Um, just ask the cat in Tallahassee. No, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think a lot of this is the unknown. And in the case of Dan Lanning, he's done enough good in a short amount of time they know his pedigree as a championship DC under Kirby and they look at James Franklin. And what do we know about James Franklin? Like the Vanderbilt thing, that's, that's history now. Like I, people, they're judging him on Penn state. And what do we know at Penn state, which is a blue blood program every year they get, and I've, I've got friends that went to Penn state. They get their, their hopes up. Then they play Ohio state and then Michigan and they predictably lose, and very often they lose badly. So I don't think – I don't have a problem with landing in front of Franklin because Franklin has to win the big game. Lanning will have to prove that, you know, now in a, in a much more difficult conference. Um, Oregon's not going to sneak up on anybody in the Big Ten. So I think it's an interesting question. I, I who would you say? Uh, so, give me the top five that, that the list you're looking at because I haven't seen this list. 
Oh, you have gosh. That? It, was, it was it was Ryan Day was one. Um, Which is ironic because he could get if he loses to Michigan, he's going to be fired. He could, he could get fired. Lanning was two or three. I don't have it in front of me, Mike, just to be honest. Okay, Lanning two or three. Jonathan. I think Jonathan Smith was up there in the top five, which I think is warranted. Um, yeah. Uh, Kirk, Kirk Ferentz was up there. Uh, PJ, guys like PJ Fleck were kind of down the list a little bit. Uh, I mean, the dude that won at Northwestern this year was at the bottom. And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> so I went. Yeah. And he did a, he did an unreal. Um, I mean, the, the, the same group, the I think. That put, I think the same group that put out the, the list, I had Deion Sanders as the third best coach in the, in the Big 12, so I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Well, when but, you make yeah, me that, think about it, when you make me think about it, the, there's that list is the, the list of coaches, not whoever wrote the rankings. Rankings, as we all know, are, you know they're worth the paper they're written on. That the, the list of Big Ten coaches, there's a lot to be – I'm not saying they're bad. But I'm saying there's a lot to be left desired because, like I said, Day is a, a loss to Michigan away from being fired. James Franklin, like, how much more are you going to put Penn State fans through where you win a, a lot of games against the teams you're superior to, but you never beat the top two in a top-heavy conference? Bielema, you know, he's hot and cold. Um, I mean, yeah, a day. I right, so just, here, here it is. I got it. It's day number one, landing number two, Franklin third, Lincoln yeah. Riley fourth, Kirk Ferentz fifth, <laughs> Luke Fickle six, Matt Rule seven, Sharon Moore eight, uh, Jed Fish ninth from Washington, Jonathan Smith 10, Bielema 11th, Signetti 12th, PJ Fleck 13th, Greg Schiano 14th. Mm. I mean, I, and then the cap, cap from Northwestern 15th. Yeah, Loxley, 16th, and Deshaun Foster, 17th, and the guy from Dude, Ryan Walter, Walters, 18th. All right, so, so I'll tell you this. All right, non non -pan pandemic year in the Pac 12 was ridiculously crazy, right? Right. Because uh, they only played so many games. So we'll, we'll throw that out. Last two non pandemic years for Mario Cristobal at Oregon, 22 and five. Danny, Dan Lanning's record, 22 and five. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I, there's I, hear, the I hear you. I, I'm not. You know? I'm not buying. I'm not bullish on Dan Lanning. I would tell you, based on that list, you really forced me to think about the hierarchy of Big Ten coaches. I, like, there's a lot it's of guys weird. that are, yeah, that are really just still establishing themselves, young in their career or or young in their stop at the Big Ten. And then there's a lot of guys that have been hot and cold, like Fleck. You know, yeah, so shine I, has worn off a little bit. Yeah, shine has worn so, off a little bit. Row the boat. We're not rowing the boat. It's the, the boat stalling, right? The boat is hasn't capsized, yeah. but it, it's it's struggling a little bit. So I, I mean, I you know again, I look at that list and I look at the SEC. It's I don't want to say it's night and day, but there's definitely a difference, right? Absolutely, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you do yeah, compare even, that even to, without saving, even without saving, you just hired the coach of the year and Kalen DeBoer, and you've got Kirby, and you've got Lane Kiffin, um. Yeah, you know, and, and you, Jim, Jimbo actually was the other national championship winning coach of the league, and he's gone too. So you lost those yeah. two guys. Right. So anyway, That's yeah. All right. So okay. we're gonna cut That's it to one. a JC four because cut uh, it to a four. My, okay. My, my number four sucked anyway. It was something about JJ McCarthy in Michigan. We'll talk about that the next week okay. when we got the draft to dig into. Number Vern Lundquist, four. <laughs> Javern Lundquist. Man, at, uh, say goodbye to Augusta National this past weekend. Yes, ago. yes. As a play-by-play -play guy, your thoughts yeah. on old Vern? Just give us your Mike Morgan feeling on Vern Lundquist. I love the guy. I've always thought he's great. Right. Grew up listening to him call games. Could care less if he chortles and in the SEC later years got some facts wrong. I, I didn't care because right, right. Gary Danielson was going to set him straight on the facts anyway. So right. love love old Vern. Uh, kind of sad. A very emotional moment at Augusta National. But your thoughts as a announcer on Vern Lunkles. I'm going to see if we can get Vern on. Um, I know, I'm not going to say I like, you know, we're buddies, but I met Vern once at the NS NASA awards, or I think that's what they changed the, the acronym, but it's the national sportscaster and sports writer awards. And I was fortunate to win that a few times during my times calling games in, um, during my time calling games in, in South Carolina. And he was the national winner. So I got to sit down and talk to Vern Lundquist. And he told me something that I didn't know at the time, and I'm not sure if everybody knows this. The way he got on SEC football 
which I, I think, you know, if you're under the age of 40, that's what you know Vern from. You don't know bowling for dollars. That's when we were like kids or zygotes. Um, and a lot of you don't realize he did NFL for years. He's a former voice of the Dallas Cowboys, like called Super Bowls. Uh, bless his heart. He's got to be the sickest man in the world right now. The drop by Jackie Smith. And then he did uh, NFL uh, on CBS. When they gave him the CBS job, and he told me this, he shared it with me. He's like, Mike, that was a demotion. I didn't ask for college football. They basically told me, Vern, we're going in another direction on NFL, but we're going to we're going to give you a shot on SEC football. And little did Vern realize that he would become that would be for a, a, a generation, if not two, that would become his trademark. So, yeah, did he slip a little? Everybody slips a little bit over time. Uh, first off, I would say on a personal level, he's one of the nicest human beings. Genuine. There's a lot of two faced people in this business, the people that you think are nice people on TV or radio, and then you meet them in person and they're not. Uh, Vern is the opposite. He's even nicer in person. And secondly, if you go back and you take his career in totality, it's a phenomenal career. Um, and I yes, I did enjoy Vern on SEC football. Uh, I think he got out at the right time when you everybody starts slipping. I don't care what profession it is, but um, I, I'm glad you brought that up, JC. I didn't know that was coming. Yeah, I think he is. Uh, he's a Hall of Famer, and he's left his mark. It caught a lot of great moments on CBS Saturdays. I mean, a lot. And one thing about Vern, he was always on the mark in the big moments. Always. He didn't. He didn't um, use hyperbole. Where you know a seven yard reception, and and you're you're just like over exaggerating it to where it's the boy who cried wolf. I don't know what a big moment is anymore because this clown keeps screaming at every play as if it's a big play. Vern picked his spots and was surgical and was a pro all the way. So yeah, um, hope he enjoy. I believe him and his wife have have a home in Colorado. Hope they enjoy uh, the great life, the outdoor life there. And I uh, hope he enjoys his retirement after a Hall of Fame and outstanding career. We don't know if Mike Griffith is going to the Hall of Fame, but he's at, he's had a heck of a career covering college football. He will join us next from the AJC and Dog Nation. We'll talk some dogs, SEC, and college football as a whole it's, as JC and Morgan rolls on. Listen up. This is for construction professionals, contractors, facility managers, or do-it-yourself homeowners. SitePro Rentals is ready to equip your upcoming project. We rent construction equipment for any size job. Boom and scissor lifts, telehandlers, skid steers, excavators, air compressors, generators, even small tools and equipment. SitePro has you covered. If you are ready for better equipment rental, call SitePro and rent from the local, friendly, Easy to do business with equipment professionals. Call 972 Rent Now. That's 972 736 8669 to rent the newest equipment in the Atlanta market. Call 972 Rent Now or visit SiteProRentals.com. Chicken cock originated in Kentucky, like so many other bourbons. And so the resurrection of it, you know, Paris, Kentucky, that's the county seat of Bourbon County. So much of this whiskey was being made in that Bourbon County, put on ships and barges and shipped down in Ohio, down the Mississippi, and got to New Orleans where it got distributed all over the world. And people kept saying, well, hey, I want some more of that whiskey from Bourbon County. And so that's how Bourbon Whiskey uh, got its name. And chicken cock originated actually in Paris, Kentucky, and, and which is today Bourbon County. We're passionate about making sure that the Nest and Wild Mattress is the best it can be. Made well and made right. Right here in Tupelo, Mississippi. So how can we do all that? Work. Hard work. And that means something. The Nest and Wild Mattress is a movement. It's a pride in where you come from and where you're going. So get comfortable. Because this movement is just beginning.
And we are back, JC and Morgan. Glad to be with you here on this Tuesday as we go back to the guest line. As we uh, told you many years now, we love the offseason because there really is no offseason in college football anymore. And it gives us an excuse to have some great guests on. And we continue that litany with Mike Griffith of the AJC and Dog Nation. He covers the dogs, but really he covers a, a whole lot more. Uh, you probably have seen him a number of times if you watch the Paul Feinbaum program, which always gets a little bit uh, spicy, dare I say. Uh, I always find your appearances very um, uh, entertaining, Mike. I've, I've been on that show a number of times, and I always feel like you know, I'm a guest in Paul's house, <laughs> and I, I, I'm not looking to make any waves or, or tick anybody off, and I just kind of break down whatever Paul's asking me. You go on there. You, you empty out a couple of barrels like, OK, who am I going to piss off today? I'm going to piss off Paul. I'm going to piss off the Florida fan base, the Ole Miss fan base. But I I love it. I mean, it's entertaining. Um, first off, pleasure to have you on. You and I finally met at the Spurrier Banquet a few months ago. We know a lot of the same people. We've uh, all, we're all covering the same type of thing. I know you and JC have crossed paths, uh, but we've never had you on. I'm glad we could make this happen. And um Appreciate the work that you do. So thanks for taking some time. Well, I really appreciate it. And, and you're right about the fine bomb show. I mean, I tell people it's like getting on an airplane. You, you don't know what you don't know if you're going to have a bumpy flight or not. And, and you know, <laughs> all kind of takes it there. And, and it's almost like if he says fasten your seatbelt, there's going to be turbulence. Then, you know, sometimes it's better to be proactive than reactive. But I get the sense that because a lot of people misunderstand, you know, they they see like a couple of people going at it like you guys do in the spirit of of entertainment. And I think Paul knows like, OK, I've got something here that's a lightning rod. When when Mike Griffith is off the show, he's going to give me two and a half hours of content because all the callers are going to be ticked off and they're going to throw you under the bus, which they do. And he's going to have some fun jabbing. But I get the feeling you guys I know Paul's not a big drinker, but you could easily just like go and have beers and have a great time. But if you didn't know any better, you would think like you guys were adversaries watching that show. Yeah. Like I said, I never I never know what's what's coming next. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, what I try to do, Mike, and I think you do it really well, is I try to say what everybody else is thinking, but maybe they're afraid to say it. I mean, right. let's be honest. There's been cases over the years, whether it was, you know, Dan Mullins Halloween costumes or, you know, some of the stuff that's happened at Old Miss that you've kind of wondered about with Lane Kiffin. And it's like. Let's not just sweep all this. I mean, is Eli Drinkwitz really the SEC coach of the year? I mean, it, this is like the you know the 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 best award you know for what the, the guys who aren't really great coaches. I mean, it, it, the thing with me, I cover Georgia now, and people say, "Well, you know, you're a Georgia fan." Well, no, actually, I covered Tennessee before that. Oh, so you're a Tennessee fan? Mm -hmm. No, I, I covered Alabama before that. Oh, so you're role time? No, before that, I covered Auburn. Well, wait a minute, why do you keep you know changing jobs? guys, it's been 30 years. It's like a yeah. coaching profession and it's been opportunities and getting to do shows like this and meet different people and, and kind of just go with the flow, go with the format. You know, Paul likes to be combative. Paul likes to touch on controversial topics. Let's go. You know, if you want to be yeah. informational and rational, uh, if you want to be fun, if you want to do the show with Chris Doring and Peter Burns, it's going to be a little bit more lighthearted, a little faster. <laughs> so I just kind of try to um, go with the flow and listen into your show today. I mean, it's, it's really entertaining, you know, listening to that list. JC was, was going off on the coaches. Um, I was trying to figure out who these – I'm like, wait a minute, these are all Big Ten coaches. And it was like, it's not a very deep list. Of no, coaches. it's not. That snuck up on me too. I was like, that's that's a little light for, for the AFC, NFC, you know, two titans of the sport right now and of college athletics. Something tells me that will be uh, upgraded with all the, the, the money – coming through that conference pretty soon. So you hit on something I was going to ask you about. That is that is your background. You've, you've covered a number of uh, uh, of different programs, and, and and you're not originally a Southern guy, right? You, you went to Michigan State. Is that right? Well, I mean, it's kind of a, you know, one of those long stories. Born born in Alabama, right? Grew okay. up in the Midwest. So because of the, the first place and the early taste of college football growing up, I always followed um, you know, college football in the South, you know, the Keith Jackson games, you mentioned, you know, Vern, mm -hmm. you could just tell that there was a passion with SEC football that does not exist. And I don't believe any of the pro sports or certainly none of the other conferences. So, you know, I stumbled across something early that I could feel the passion for. And I love sports. I played sports. 
And so my goal, my career goal uh, was to come down and cover the SEC. And I had the opportunity to do that in 93, uh, covering Auburn. And, and they went 11-0 and 0 and uh, did, a, did a good job there. So I got uh, hired in Mobile, uh, where I was born. Uh, got promoted to the Alabama beat and got to work with Gene Stallings. And that's mm. Abel Sweeney. And, and these guys open the doors up. And every practice is open. And you learn so much. And then Knoxville calls with a job. So I go up there in 98. They win a national title with Philip Fulmer and John Chavis and David Cutcliffe. And now these coaches are who I'm talking to on a daily basis. And just learning so much about the game and breaking it down that when it was time to move on and, and go back to Michigan State for four years and go back to Tennessee or go back, everything's closed. But I know what's happening behind those doors, Mike. And you've been in covering this long enough to know as well mm -hmm. what's really going down. So I'm not necessarily stuck eating the narrative that they want to feed all of us. You know, when it's time to call BS, we can do that. Sure. Uh, so how long officially have you been on the Georgia beat? It's a belie unbelievable. It's 2018. So it's 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 3. You can tell I'm a journalist, made, not a math major. I guess this is seven years, right? Okay. And, and so, I do the SEC stuff as well. And it's right, right, right. But I mean, you talk about timing. I mean, yeah. you, you're you're around for were you were you covering Alabama the '92 title under Stallings? No, I got I got there. Uh, I was at Auburn in '93, and I did Bama '94 to '97. Okay, that's right. Okay, yeah, I got my. Uh, you covered the the probation, the, the Terry Bowden years. Um, that well, was always because he starts off twenty one and one. <laughs> and then well, just, he won his first yeah. eighteen games. I mean, right. I, I'm still waiting for the ESPN thirty for thirty, the the best team you never saw. Yes, the only undefeated team in the nation that year. That's right. That's right. I remember uh, you'd have to for their conference games, you'd have to buy them on pay per view, you, because they weren't allowed to. Back then, we had TV bands, so if you wanted to see Auburn play a game in '93, uh, and and you were like an opposing fan and you wanted to see them play on the road at Jordan Air Stadium, you had to pay thirty bucks because they weren't allowed to be on TV. Um, where I was going with all that was, I. From a standpoint of you get to cover the, the what has become the premier program in college football. So right. that's the cool part, right? I mean, you're going to national championship games every just about every year. You're going to playoffs just about every year. You're going to Atlanta for the SEC championship game just about every year. Georgia, to me, has almost become the most boring program to talk about because they're just so damn good. And they don't have other than, you know, kids in cars committing a lot of violations they don't have a ton of controversy they don't have a whole lot of um you know angst or setbacks or just the things that normally are great for you guys to cover you know in print uh it hadn't it hadn't been a lot of that it's been a lot of roses so how do you as a guy that you know likes to report all sides of everything how do you try and balance that at all? Because it's been pretty damn rosy in Athens here the last few years. Well, I mean, you just said it. I mean, Georgia is the Rodney Dangerfield of national championship programs. I mean, listen, Kirby Smart hasn't lost a regular season game since 2020. I mean, that is just mind-blowing to yes. me. Kirby Smart had three straight undefeated SEC seasons. That had never happened. Going back to 92, nobody had done that. Nobody, much less in an era where there's portal and transfers and NIL. This is easily the most competitive era ever. I mean, the guy's won 20 straight games going back to 2018 when he's had more than a week to prepare. And there's no active coaches in college football that have beat this guy since 2018. And, 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 and but, he, but he can't win coach of the year, Mike, because when I talk to people about it, they say, well, he's supposed to win. Yeah. Okay. Well, so tell me when in these last two national championship runs in the last three years, uh, you know, when <laughs> they, they lost one regular, you know, they lost at Alabama, the SEC, there, there were no coach of the years then either. So to your point, you know, it's just assumed that Kirby's supposed to win. It's just assumed that George is supposed to win. And yet when they won the title in 2021, they hadn't won one in 40 years. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the reality of it is, and, and Kirby always finds the, and listen, he, he doesn't talk about any of this stuff. He has no clue. All he cares about is tomorrow, you know, winning the race to the mailbox with his kid to get mail. You, you know how competitive this guy is. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a rat's ass about this stuff. But when I'm watching this and I'm looking at how this is going to be reflected in history 20 years from now, and someone says, hey, who is the best coach in the SEC in 2023? 
oh, that was Eli Drinkwitz. Was it really? <laughs> I mean, I'd give it to Sid. Was it really Eli Drink? Oh, well, you know how it works. We got to kind of lift the little guy. Don't tell Oklahoma that Eli Drinkwitz in Missouri is the little guy because they're outbidding Oklahoma for Oklahoma players and players that Oklahoma wants. So if you're wondering what happened to Oklahoma football, it's in Missouri now. They're getting those players. Missouri has more money and is doing a better job, okay? Uh, and so, so no, I'm not trying to diss Missouri. I'm just trying to make the point that I would like to see the best coaches win coach of the year. I, I think, Mike, that we're doing ourselves a, an injustice by rewarding the wrong people. And I think Georgia, you know, because of the Nick Saban factor – I mean, how many times are we going to hear on game day between now and, you know, Nick's next fireside chat about uh, how happy he is in his retirement is he looks absolutely miserable when they show him on camera watching basketball games that Nick Saban was five and one against Kirby Smart. My God, that has jumped the shark. But you know what? I get it. Uh, he's an ESPN personality. You're going to play him up. He did beat uh, Kirby that many times. But, but that ship has sailed. But we're not hearing about, to your point, which you brought up, we don't hear a lot about Georgia, even though Kirby has built the best program in the nation. He doesn't get the individual accolades like I think he should, some, and you don't talk about the program very much when all they've done is is win. I mean, I think this is kind of a Nebraska-like run when I think of Nebraska and the, and mm -hmm. the this has been that level of dominance, but you just you just don't hear a lot about it in the national narrative. I think a lot of people, I was talking about geography and how, how large a role it plays and what programs can be dominant and what just kind of remain mediocre or some flounder. People always looked at the Georgia job as an elite job that you should be able to get all kinds of talent because it's a talent-rich state. You're not far from Atlanta. It's a cool campus. Like It's got everything going for it. To those people, I would remind you that Ray Goff had great recruiting classes and didn't win anything in Athens for years. Uh, there were other coaches uh, that went to Athens and had, you know, here and there blips of success. And I'm look, I love Mark Richt and, and he was at that uh, event that you and I were there and, and class act and, and he helped set the table. I, I've always said he deserves some of the credit for setting the table for Kirby. Kirby took over. Most coaches take over after a fired coach and it's a broken down car. No, he had a really nice car. He just needed to fine tune it a little bit. But that said, Mark couldn't get it to the level that Kirby did. So uh, there's no question. He's an elite coach. He's done an elite job. And he has this thing rolling. I mean, you just had a spring game. I know you covered. Does Georgia have any needs whatsoever? Every program out there has needs. What does Georgia's need? Well, I'll just, I, I'll just, I want to skip back on something you said and make a point. Yeah. Um, as far as Mark and Kirby, Mark didn't have facilities and Mark didn't have the investment of the boosters to the level Kirby does. Right. And I will draw a parallel to when I covered Michigan state and got to know Tom Izzo really well on that beat. As you said, I went there, Nick, Nick Saban couldn't win. He, he couldn't win big at Michigan state. And I don't want to say it was, that, that Mark Rick was as strapped as Saban, but Saban's problem with Michigan state was they didn't want to make the financial commitment to get the things in place that they needed to go head to head with the Michigans and the Ohio states when it came to facilities and recruiting budget and, not that anybody was being paid back then, wink, wink, but he, he did not get the commitment that he needed. And so even a guy like Nick Saban has to have things in place. And, and that in fact was part of the deals that he made when he went to LSU in Alabama was to have the things in place that you needed to win. When Kirby came to Georgia, there were some agreements in place that this, this building was going to get built, this football building. And I'm sure, you know, this, uh, you know, this donor group was going to be formed. So, these are coaches that I think along the way I'm saving and, and the Saban story came up for me because Mark D'Antonio did such a phenomenal job uh, winning a couple of big 10 titles. I mean, how does Michigan state ever beat Ohio state, Mike? I don't know that we're ever going to see that happen mm -hmm. again. That should have never happened. Uh, but because of Nick Saban's push and Michigan state realizing this guy got away, they said, you know what, let's this time around, let's listen to the head coach and, and do what he says we need. Um, and I think that's what happened at Georgia. So I say that, because I don't think that Mark had the same things to work with as Kirby. Jeremy Pruitt was a guy in this mix. You might remember Jeremy spoke up about this when he was an assistant on Mark's staff, kind of stirred the pot, upset a lot of people when he said, look, you know, we, these facilities here, you know, hey, we got to get a bit, you know, and people are like, whoa, whoa, hush, hush. No, you need that. People say, well, what happened to Florida? Florida for years did not invest in the facilities. 
Now, you can say that Dan Mullen was behind, the, but the bottom line was if you're not constantly building, uh, you're going to fall behind quickly. So I, I just, again, I just, I wanted to straighten the narrative because I think sometimes coaches get put in a box. And, and I think Mark Rick was a, a fantastic coach and, and he was at that event, Mike. And I was so glad you were there because that was the third year of the Spurrier Award. And I started that award three years ago with Coach Spurrier because I felt like this is a guy that should be honored. When I think about great times in college football, I think about those 1990 Gators. And like I said at that, that night, I said there were two scores everybody was looking for if they weren't at the game. They wanted to see what their favorite team was doing, and they wanted to see who Spurrier was putting it on and what the score was. <laughs> and, and that was just how it was. And so uh, we honored Mark as a legend, and to see Coach Rick and Coach Spurrier on the stage together, you know, to me, that's, that's what makes college football special. I don't want to lose that, man. I want to see these coaches, these faces, these personalities, these names. Uh, I want to see this continue. And so your programming is very important to have historians like you and JC um, that can speak of the past, that can put the, the current into perspective. Because, my gosh, if you go on Twitter, there is so much garbage you can get on your brain. It's, it's hard to know who to trust and what to believe. But when you've got a show like this with – with folks like you that have got the, the history and the background and the journalistic integrity to provide good perspective, this is what protects the sport. So again, I appreciate I'm really that to be on with you today. It's it's a great conversation. Oh, uh, that's that's very nice of you to say. I mean, we we consider this a, a labor of love, right, JC? I mean, this is just like we we can't think of anything we'd rather do than not just follow college football, but but talk about it and hopefully somewhat intelligently. Well, I, I just know every time when we've talked about recruiting, uh, I just remember looking at Google and JC Sherbert so many times because I was not I was not that guy. Like, uh, let me see. How good do I think he is? Uh, uh, according to, you know, you just um, yeah, it, this is a great landscape for us. And and I love your uh, I love your backdrop, by the way. All the right moves is absolutely <laughs> one of the best movies I say and pipe you say that's right that's craig t nelson as the coach you got chris penn sean penn, uh, penn's brother what looked like a very slow uh linebacker I don't mean to feed into stereotypes but he was still getting looks if he didn't impregnate his girlfriend who knows what would have happened yes it's a classic uh, 80s movie that you gotta a see a Furman reference in there. Uh, I'm, I'm a Furman from reference. Yep. I'm from upstate South Carolina, so Furman in the '80s was a power. So I was like, it's like, oh, is it juniors going to Furman? <laughs> yeah, when he was like talking about it. Oh, so and so's going to NC State. So and so's going to Furman, and he ended up going to Cal Poly, which is probably one of the most beautiful campuses in the country, from Western Smogfield, Pennsylvania, to Cal Poly. So uh, he kind of got a uh, a rebirth there, so to speak, when Coach. Craig T. Nelson took it with him. Play the ball, so, not the man, JC. Play the ball, play the don't ball, go through the man. the man. I mean, those tenets still apply today, 40 years later, when you're talking about great cornerback play. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm, st I'm still disappointed that, that they that they lost to that team with the with the dynamic running back. Walnut Heights. Walnut Heights. That's Walnut right. Heights should have taken the safety. Instead, they hand it off to the fullback. He had a lot of issues going on. He fumbles it on a wet field. And yeah, it's a, it's a heartbreaker. It still pains me today. Kind of like I'm not Alabama's even a part of it. Kind of like Alabama's loss to Michigan. The quarterback runs the wrong way. The, yep. dynasty, the legacy is ruined. Yeah. Nick Saban couldn't beat Michigan at Michigan State. Ironically enough, he gets knocked out of college football. Oh, boy. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I mean, you, you've, you've, Given Saban a, a little ribbing on 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 the shows before, I know you have respect for him. We all do, oh, but I, that brings me to the question: Like, what what take did you have that drew the most ire from from SEC fans or college football wow. fans in general? Well, there's been a couple. Uh, one was when Paul asked me where I thought Kyle Trask would finish in the Heisman Trophy race after they beat uh, Georgia in 2020, and I said fourth or fifth. I remember he that. Just, yeah, he was, he was appalled by that. Which, by the way, Kyle Trask finished fourth in the Heisman trade. Right, right. And, and probably the <laughs> second when I talked about the awkwardness of the Kalen DeBoer takeover, when you know Saban just you know staring him down from the front row, and and I said, look, there wasn't a good answer for this. If he's not there, he's not supporting. If he is there, he's a distraction. I mean, Kalen DeBoer. Who? I mean, have you ever even heard of this guy? Too. Let's be honest. When when Kalen DeBoer was there with Fresno State. Were there Alabama fans going, 
you know, that guy on the other sideline, he might lead this program one day. When right. he was in Indiana and those Indiana staff members were going out for dinners, they were saying, you know what, five or six of us are going to be coaching that Alabama team here in a few <laughs> years. I mean, no. I mean, this this was – and the crazy part about it, Mike, was you could see this coming a mile away. Um, you could see that Saban was on his way out. Uh, you could, he was not being the same guy. I mean, he was on television every week, you know, you know, yakking it up with Yahoo McAfee. Like, like he really enjoyed this guy's company and they were on the level. Like you really think these guys would go out for a beer together? No, they were preparing Nick for his next role with ESPN. He's buying the $17 million house. He's buying the deal. That doesn't mean anything, doesn't it? Because that ain't the Nick Saban we knew. And then, and then the take that I just can't get away from when people say, Conveniently enough, man, last year was one of his best coaching jobs ever. That is uh, insulting to Nick Saban. It was one of his worst coaching jobs ever because at the start of the year, they didn't know how to use their quarterback because they lost at home by 10 points to Texas, a team they should have beat by two touchdowns because they had to bench their starting quarterback. That is not a good coaching job. That is not being ready for the season. You look at the number of first rounders, this Alabama team, uh, should have, to, in my opinion, won a national title. We saw what they could do against Georgia. Their best was better than Georgia's best. We could play the injury game with Brock Bowers all day long, but bottom line was Jalen Milrow played better than Carson Beck when the team's season were on the line. So I'm not going to insult Nick Saban by saying that was one of his best coaching jobs because it wasn't. And I'm also not going to sit here and say I'm convinced that he's done with college football, not because I know anything or not because I think that, you know, he can walk back on the sidelines and lead any team to victory, but because of the the line in the uh, Jurassic Park movie, I just can't get it out of my head when, when they, they got the T-Rex there and they, they're trying to, you know, give him a goat. And the scientist says, T-Rex doesn't want to be fed. Nick Saban does not want to be on the sidelines on college football Saturdays. And this cat, is a competitor and that is what has made him the best of our lifetime is that he is never complacent now unless there's some underlying health issues which i don't think there is he takes remarkable care of himself i think he's got games left in him i don't know if one season on the sidelines enough mike i don't know if he needs some college football reform where he feels like he could do it and be competitive again but i'm, I'm just 72 nick saban i still would take a 73 year old nick saban over 99 percent of the coaches in the country I'd like to see is, him take sorry. Go ahead. I'd like to go see ahead, him Jason. take a job that maybe he's not as good, like West Virginia. Like <laughs> oh. if he came full circle and took West Virginia, the team of his childhood he grew up pulling for. There'd be a lot of couches burned in Morgantown for sure, uh, the day of the press conference. Uh, but man, something like that. You know, go go to West Virginia for two or three years and hand it off. I don't know. Uh, that, that feels awful, like an awful lot like Lou Holtz at South Carolina. But I, I, I will say this Saban at 72 is in much better shape than Lou was at 69. When oh, he heck yeah. I mean, you know? I, I think to your point, Mike, there's no question in my mind Nick could, could still do it. But I've told this story on the air 2022 is the last Alabama football game I did on TV for the SEC network. And you know how those meetings are, you go in. And you get 30 minutes with the head coach. You get uh, whatever it is, 20 with the coordinators. And then oh, Kool-Aid McKinstry and another guy, you get 10 minutes with them. And, but the 30 minutes with, with the coach, usually you're asking game-specific questions or things you like about your team. And I asked one rather innocuous question. I can't even remember what it was. And he took that baton. And I'm not kidding. He went over 20 minutes, a soliloquy, a diatribe, uninterrupted. It had nothing to do with the game. It had nothing to do with his team. It was the state of college football and how it was being completely train wrecked. And I left that meeting thinking, you know what? This guy doesn't want to do this in this climate much longer. And I know he'll, he, he doesn't want that to be his legacy. I, I quit because of, of NIL and the portal. But there's no doubt in my mind, like, that was it. Like, he, he just doesn't want to play that game. And Kirby manages to stay above that and he's i don't know if kirby likes it or not but he knows you got to play the game if you're going to stay dominant so and and lane like lane's been critical about it but they just led the the country in portal power right. and he found a bunch of money so you either you either play the game and you win and you dominate or you don't 
and you get left behind, or you do what Nick did. And you just say, you know what? I don't. I've had enough of this. You 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 pull a Jay Wright, you pull a Shashesky, and you just say, I don't need this anymore in my life. I got a lot of money. I was all about coaching ball. It's not just about coaching ball anymore. What What are your thoughts on the the climate of all that? Yeah, you know it's challenging. It's uh it's fluid. Um, you know I've never seen college football with this many changes at one time. I mean, right about the time you solve one problem or think that you've got it down, the the, the rules change, the, the the transfer portal dates shift, people become immediately eligible, and yet the SEC is still saying that if you transfer this spring, you can't transfer and be immediately eligible within the SEC, which protects the SEC schools from each other but hurts the conference overall because now other conferences can come in and pilfer from the SEC and get guys immediately eligible. Uh, but to your point about what Kirby does, I mean, that's why he's so fascinating to me to cover as a coach. A lot of people will say, well, gosh, sometimes he snaps. And, and sometimes he, you know, it, listen, I don't go to the zoo to watch the bear sleep. I want to, I want Kirby smart. And the best <laughs> press conferences are on Tuesdays after practice when he comes in there and he's got the visor pulled down over his eyes and he's still a little sweaty and angry about whatever he saw on the field. And he's not really putting a filter on the question on the answers. You know, Monday he goes in there, he's all calm, he's relaxed, he knows everything he's going to be asked. He's got loafers on and looks like he could go to the, you know, the business meeting and, you know, help raise money for, you know, the local baseball team. I want Coach Kirby on Tuesday because he cuts through some stuff, man. And um, you, some of his concepts and ideas – a lot of it is just being willing. Um, it's efficiency, Mike. It's efficiency. There's nothing that Kirby does uh, that's not designed towards winning a title. And I tell people this. If you want to know Kirby's answer to a question before you ask it, ask yourself, does it help him win a championship? Yes or no. And whining and complaining about the rules is not going to help him win a championship. He's not going to waste any time on that. He was on the rules committee. He's given his input to his college football president, to his university president, who was on the NCAA committee. Kirby has played these things out to the extent that he can, and then he moves on. Everything is about efficiency with this cat. And now that you've got this portal where you know you're going to have attrition, you know you're going to lose guys. It was Kirby that said last December, hey, you guys are making this portal out to be a bad thing. It's not. There's some good things about the portal. And I was like, wait a minute. Wait, what, what do you mean? You need some attrition. And, and JC understands this. You know, for those young guys to come in, some of that dead weight's got to go out. Now, there were some tricky ways that coaches would do this before with the medical red shirt, right? And, and there were some hard conversations because you didn't want the reputation that you ran a kid off. What do you mean so-and-so had a scholarship and Saban told him to hit the bricks? Right, well, you know, or maybe, you know, Coach X, suddenly some guy is, is, is running after. I mean, you've seen some stuff over the years. They need those scholarships available. And now, uh, like I saw Purdue, uh, you know, the Purdue head coach was there at the Spurrier Banquet this year. And I talked to him. He's got four former Georgia guys. None of those guys were going to start. Let me tell you, for Purdue – Getting those four Georgia guys under the Christmas tree, oh, my God. They love these guys. They can't wait to get these four Georgia guys. At Georgia, we're like, what was that guy's name? Right? So it works in that sense where these players who get buried on deep depth charts have opportunities. Then, meantime, those four slots open up, and now Kirby can pour in another class of 20 midterm signees. Of those 20, 12 will pan out. Two or three will get injured, and another five or six will hit the portal in the next two years. That's how the power teams eat. And then there's the teams beneath that are getting the leftovers. Conversely, in Georgia basketball, I'm looking at their roster this year. They got some guy that played at Niagara, right? They got some guy that was a one-year transfer at South Florida. You know, they, they got another guy that Virginia dumped a few years ago. Uh, and then they got two top 100 freshmen. And this is this team is this team is supposed to play against uh, the likes of Kentucky and Alabama. You really think that Mike White has a shot with these guys? So Georgia, conversely, in basketball, they're trying to. And the word reject is too strong. That's not the right word. We're not going to say that. But they're trying to win with guys that couldn't start at other programs or that started anonymous programs, and that's what we're going to see with this portal. And Lane Kiffin is so far out in front of it, and he's smart enough. He's also got the Mississippi Junior College system there. Lane is Lane is really good with his personnel. He's great. He's a great offensive coach. Uh, he's a fun character. He's one of those characters you need. Mike, I don't know if you ever did NASCAR, but I kind of liken these SEC coaches to the NASCAR circuit. 
Uh, and and that and I always go with Saban. You know, Saban's my Earnhardt, right? Like everybody, you know, he was the man in black, right? And Nick is that guy. And and um, and I, I'm trying to, you know, who who is Lane Kiffin on the NASCAR? Sterling Marlin, maybe I don't know, but he's a personality. He's a lot of fun. He, I I can't do a good na- my NASCAR references are out of date, but he imagine if uh, DeChambeau was winning more majors. <laughs> you know, he he's got a little DeChambeau in him from the from the golf side. You know, there's a lot of people that's just hate Lane Kiffin. Uh, and, and I think he earned a lot of that negative. I've watched Lane mature, for lack of a better term. Sure. I mean, Lane, when he was at Tennessee and with the Raiders, you know, quite frankly, he was unlikable. He, he was not like he was just not likable and did a lot of silly things and said a lot of silly thing, stuff. Now, I think he's extremely likable. I'm so glad that we have him in the SEC. Oh, his, 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 his color is great. He, you know, not, not the best speaker in the world, but he's fantastic. There's just, there's not a better Twitter follow uh, in per he's getting better at the in-person stuff. That's, you know, when we see him at SEC uh, spring meetings and we get a little bit more one-on-one time, but, but you're right. What happened at Tennessee? I mean, he left that place like nuclear waste. I mean, there, there, there was a stench from that investigation that lasted basically buried Derek Dooley because the NCAA investigation was hanging over the program the whole time. And, and then there were recruiting uh, limitations that even leaked into, into Butch Jones. Um, you know, you, you, you say that I come with both barrels. Well, this isn't really a barrel. This is just a thought I've had in the off season. And uh, we, I mentioned Jeremy Pruitt a second ago, right? And I'm seeing what, how the NCAA went to court with Tennessee and Virginia. And they basically said, Hey, you can't uphold these rules. You can't apply uh, your NCAA rules to the Constitution of the United States. And if this kid wanted money for a collective and it stands up in a court of law, you can't put you, you, that, you, that just doesn't hold water. How in the world do you tell somebody they can't work in their line of work for five years because of sixty thousand dollars? I mean, it, 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 like I'm like part of me is waiting for Jeremy Pruitt to like go to court or something because it's like, how do you do that? What other what other world does a coach get a show cause penalty where you can't even be on the field. You can't be on, in the stadium on game day because there were violations that equaled $60,000 when we've got players. I mean, I think that's, I'm not joking here. This is true. I think that's less than the base salary that, that sec starters have now through NIL for every, every starter. That's oh, their good. base salary. Well, if you go to the median NIL deal for starting quarterbacks in the SEC, it's probably close to a million. And then there's Carson Beck. And then there's Carson Beck who's driving <laughs> around in his Lamborghini. What, what is his deal, Mike? Have you gotten to the bottom of that one? He, listen, he, listen, Carson is just this guy. I mean, he, he got to understand. I, I don't it, awkward is nerdy and awkward. Are, those are way too strong. But now this is a, now I want you to pick. This is a guy who solves Rubik's cube in under a minute. Okay. This is a guy who likes to spend time alone in his room. He's not he's not a very social person. He solves the Rubik's Cube. He was a baseball player, you know, with a scholarship. This is a guy who uh, saw his chance at starting uh, blow up because he had a bad week of practice, the UAB game. Stetson Bennett goes out there. Uh, UAB, you know, forgets how to play defense, and Stetson's lobbing balls all over the field. And then he had like four or five touchdowns in the first half of that game. And if you're Carson Beck, you're realizing – I was the starter at the beginning of this week and I practiced so poorly that they, they pulled my starter card and started Stetson instead. And you've got two years, Mike, of watching that Wally Pip action in front of you. I, 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 you know, I, I'm trying to wrap my brain around how hard that would be to stomach and swallow that that was my opportunity that I lost. And yet he stayed in the program. So that background alone tells you he's a little different cat. And he is really, really good. As for this, you know, you know, we're trying to play this game that, oh, there was no negotiation. He just loves college. Listen, there was a negotiation. Sure. Maybe not from Carson sitting down across from Kirby. That's not how it works. Everybody's got people. But the reality was if Carson would have gone pro, he probably would have probably would have been third third quarterback taken, start of the second round. So what they did is they said, well, look, let's look, let's see how much um uh, what did the the Kentucky quarterback Will uh, Levis? Let's, let's take yeah. a look at what Will Levis's contract was last year because we think that's the comp for Carson. Okay, mm-hmm. 
Somehow, some way, same, some show. This is what I'm told. Sourced information. I've written it before. Um, it's nothing's official. That's another part of this transfer portal. It's and I also hard is we don't have the cold hard numbers like you do in the NFL. They don't have to relinquish this information. But what I was told, I'm pretty good authority, was that they wanted a package. So it's not a paycheck, and it didn't all come from Georgia. I was told a booster kicked in and said, "How much you need? Okay, here's you know whatever million, two million towards this package." The approximately four million includes living quarters and money and all these different things. And Kirby got it done early. And that was so key because they locked down Carson Beck, Mike. They were able to get Trevor Etienne, who I think will be probably the biggest impact transfer in the league this year after watching him play Saturday. They were able to go out and get a couple of talented receivers like Colby Young from Miami, uh, like London Humphreys, uh, you know, this rising star kid out of Vanderbilt. Kirby did what he had to do, right? Like we go back to it. Fundamentally, how many people like it? You're going to let some kid tell you what you got to do. Does it help me win a championship? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, do it. Get it done. Let's move on. And now Carson, watching him in that spring game, let me tell you, this guy is putting balls on the spot like Aaron Rodgers. Now his numbers didn't look great because they're playing the same team that plays them every day. They're mixing up different things. They're not going to show you their best work. But Georgia has an NFL quarterback this year on their roster. And it cost him a little bit of money, but if they didn't have this guy, Mike, they wouldn't have a chance to win a national championship. This year. I'll, I'll just say one thing on that. And I know JC's got a question. Um, the for those that despise all that is NIL, I'm going to give you one thing that I think is really good about NIL for college football and for the young men who play it. the The numbers of kids that are that were declaring early and clearly got bad advice. Kids that declared early thought they'd be a, a, a middle to a high round draft pick, not drafted at all. Kids that were told, oh, yeah, you're going to be a first rounder drafted in the third round. And a kid like Carson Beck uh, in the old in the non NIL period, he'd have to go pro. Yeah. It just, it, you'd leave too much money on the table. He would he would be gone. OK, now those guys are staying because a seven figure NIL like that's literal pro money like your rookie deal in NFL you're not necessarily getting that much, or it's comparable at least. So I, I, I would I would say that that is the one positive thing, because it's not like college basketball where you can leave after one year. It's not like baseball where you can go straight out of high school. You, in, in college football, you have a three-year commitment regardless, and a lot of guys, after their redshirt sophomore year or their third year, they would bolt and get terrible advice, and it would be bad for the school, and it would be bad for the young man. Now with NIL, less and less of those mistakes are being made. So I will say that for those that just think NIL is the bane of all existence. I don't think it is. I think it needs some guardrails. But but that is one positive I would just point out about it. Did you see JC had a question? I'm, he I'm, did. Oh, yeah. yeah there we go. Uh, okay, so looking at Georgia, uh, obviously the Rick Pitino called Kentucky basketball the Roman Empire of college basketball <laughs> recently. Right now, Georgia's – Maybe uh, Athens or Sparta. They're getting there, you know. I mean, it's uh, uh, and look, I've worked in Georgia. I've covered. Georgia. I know a lot of dogs. Yeah, they were a long suffering bunch, as you well know. So uh, for the fans that I know, especially my friends, not the ones that bark in your face when you're walking in the stadium or get down on all fours and hike their leg like one kid did last year. Uh, <laughs> for their good fans, I'm I'm happy for them, you know. Uh, you're looking at the schedule, though. It, it, it's not the SEC East sort of cakewalk that it has been. Mike, at Alabama, you got to go to Bryant Denny. You got to go to Daryl K. Royal in Texas. You got to go to Vault Hemingway. Um, at Kentucky, yeah. If Clemson's offense were a little better, I'd say that would be a challenge. This schedule uh, is a lot more challenging than maybe the last uh, two or three have been. Uh, for the dogs, how, how do you think? Uh, how do you think that'll factor into the possibilities this season as we do away? With, and, and I don't like that, by the way, doing away with divisions. But as we do away with divisions that go one through sixteen and all that stuff. Well, I mean, I mean, JC, you're right. I mean, the schedule this year is is ridiculous. And in Georgia's twenty nine game win streak, just to put this into perspective, I, th I think I think we're all. I don't think Georgia was quite as dominant last year as maybe, you know, when they rode off into the sunset, they were, they were stomping Florida state into the ground and, you know, fighting the good fight as a program that opted in 
you know, kids that well, why play in a bowl game if it's not a playoff? Because because we love each other, because we want to play with our brothers one more time. Um, whereas Florida State's like, you know, show me the money. I'm out of here. Don't really care. And they have to stand there and watch their teammates and their school's image take a 63 to three beating that will never go away will never go away. When George and Florida State sit down together in a living room recruiting the same guy, that conversation will be had, that this program was all in and this program was all about the money. And there's nothing that Mike Norvell can do about that. That that's, That is a score in a moment that will never go away. Should have been made a bigger deal of, frankly, because whenever these people, we got to do something about this in college. But yeah, you got to do something. You got to teach your kids character. You got to teach your kids commitment. You got to do enough for them that they want to do something for you. You got to be that kind of coach and that, that serves your team and where they feel that obligation, where they want to play that game. That's what you do about it. You do a better job as a coach and as a mentor, and you don't rely as much on transfers who have not invested anything into the program. So they don't feel any responsibility toward the spear. They were just there for the check. Don't expect them to risk anything because they came for the money. So they're going to leave for the money. Georgia kids, less transfers, more guys brought up through the program, they're going to be more bought in. So um, I digress. Uh, when we look at the 29-game Georgia win streak, which, by the way, tied Clemson for the longest in the college. I'm saying all these things because people are probably, why didn't we hear this? Because they don't talk about it. This was the longest win streak. It's longer than anything Nick Saban did. In the college football playoff era, 29 straight wins. And they beat seven, uh, I want to say they beat five or seven top five teams. Here's an amazing stat for you. Uh, Vince Dooley's Herschel Walker teams never beat a top five team, and they were never a preseason top five. So if you want to talk about even the golden years and the good old good old days, they weren't this good, not even close. This is a whole nother level that Georgia football has ever done, even before the great Herschel Walker. Uh, listen, I, I'm not going to sell Clemson down the river. I know Dabo. I know you talk about a guy that invests hard. It's the first game of the season. Clemson's won five in a row ever since that goofy phone call that, that got Dabo so doggone mad when he told everybody to invest in Clemson. I wink, wink. I, I got the message, Dabo. Thank you. Uh, that paid off very well. Uh, the guy has not lost another game since. These coaches know what it's all about, and Clemson is going to put up a fight, guys. I'm going to tell you that is not going to be a blowout game. Clemson is, is going to give Georgia trouble. Uh, Kentucky, I mean, listen, Kentucky is always one of those – you know, black and blue matches. I don't know what the scoreboard says, but everybody's walking off the field uh, pretty sore, you know, after after Mark Stoops. I mean, I, I, I think Texas A&M would have done well to hire this guy. I think Alabama would have done well to hire this guy. I think there was a history of co hiring Kentucky coaches to Alabama. They did pretty well. I think Bama would have been better off with Mark Stoops. But I digress. That game is in Lexington. Brock Vandergriff, who was the number two quarterback at Georgia, is going to be the quarterback for the Wildcats. Do you think they're going to have a pretty good idea about the Georgia playbook? Jamon Dumas Johnson, who is the quote unquote heart and soul of the Georgia defense, is their starting middle linebacker. He's an All-American and a former Buckus Award finalist. Those guys are going to be the leaders of that team. They are going to control the pulse. And those Wildcats, whatever, whatever that, whatever game they got in them, whatever they've got ability, they're going to be ready in Lexington for Georgia, and they will know the offense. So these two games. Clemson and Kentucky, you might go, ah, you know, Clemson, Kentucky. Hey, no, let's go back a minute now. That 29-game win streak, only five of those games were single-digit games, only five. Auburn was one of them last year. Auburn. Missouri was one. Missouri? Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech? There was some close game, And then they lost to Alabama? I, I'm forgetting. There was another single-score game in there. But Georgia was not as dominant as – they looked at the end of the year. They, that, that team, there were five straight games, guys. This is amazing. There were five straight games where Georgia gave up a score on the opening drive. Five in a row. And, and when, it, when the last one, when, the guy, when it happened against Tennessee on the second, which all the Georgia players said it was the loudest stadium they'd ever been, when Tennessee scored on our first or second play of the game, and the guy goes 60, this, yard, this running back just blows up the metal. Neyland Stadium just explodes. I mean, you can just feel the orange in the air. It's just like, holy. I mean, I've covered that team uh, for 12 years, and when that place went off, it was like a bomb when Tennessee scored early. And after the game, we asked Kirby about it. And we asked him about it after every game. He knows. The, he goes, well, he said, you know, uh, he said, me and Shu were talking. And uh, I said, well, let's just let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. We know they're going to score early. Let's just let them go ahead and score. Free. You know, Kirby expressing a little humor. And ironically enough, that let enough air out of the room that it, that it didn't happen again. But 
then they play Alabama in Tuscaloosa. I will say Georgia will be the more prepared team having faced Clemson and Kentucky. Uh, that's a double-edged sword, right? Bama's going to have a better idea who, who Georgia is, but Georgia will have a better idea about themselves. I think Bama plays uh, maybe Wisconsin or something is, is their uh, early game. So that's a tough – you mentioned Texas. That, by the way, uh, uh, their coach – was the last coach, active coach, Tom Herman, to beat Georgia uh, back in 2018 in, in the Sugar Bowl. And that was also the last game that Kirby lost when he had more than a week to prepare. This Texas game is going to be big. Quinn Ewers, Carson Beck, you're probably talking about two of the three, if not four Heisman favorites going head-to-head the middle of October. Um, then you talk about Old Miss, at Old Miss. Uh, boy, Kirby got housed there bad by Hugh Freeze his first year. Um, I don't think he's won in that stadium yet. Uh, that, that can be a house of horrors for teams. It's a small place. It's a little, little bit out there, a little bit different than what Georgia used to going into. But, but I, don't, I don't write off Auburn. I don't write off Tennessee because this is the SEC, man. And every week the emotions are at a fever pitch. And if you don't match those emotions or if Carson has a bad day, listen, they were almost down two scores at Vanderbilt last year. I mean, at Vanderbilt, I mean, I'm not joking. I'm watching this game. And, and Georgia Tech and Brent Key has given all of them the, what they've wanted. Brent Key, who, who has the, the formula because he was on the Saban staff after Kirby, who understands Georgia, whose team spends 365 thinking about nothing but Georgia. And you got to play this team the week before you go play in the SEC title game? They've had nothing else to think about because they haven't done anything else for the most <laughs> part in, on the on the flats. Hey, final 60 seconds. When Georgia makes it to Atlanta for another SEC I mean, that was a great that was a great uh, speech on how good the league is and how things can trip Georgia up. I don't disagree with any of that. That being said, when they make it to the SEC championship game again <laughs> in Atlanta, who do you think they're going to face? Wow. Uh, man, that is no divisions. Know. As JC pointed out, it's well, just I mean, whoever's it, it, number two. You heard me be critical of Nick Saban earlier. Who's to say that Kalen DeBoer doesn't do a better job than Nick Saban in year one. Who's to say, well, I, I would not be surprised at all. If Alabama's in Atlanta taking on Georgia and yet another matchup between the dogs and the tide. Jalen Milrow to me does not get enough credit. I know he's had some bad moments. I know we, we joked a little bit earlier about him making the wrong read against Michigan and costing his team the game. But I watched that guy at, at, at Auburn. I was at Auburn. Uh, I, I saw that the Auburn miracle throw there and the never say die attitude. And I watched the SEC title game and kept waiting for Jalen Milrow to have a Milrow moment. And he didn't. He was flawless. And if he's got a coach who can work with him and get this guy dialed in, I think he is phenomenal, man. I mean, this guy, uh, his athleticism, his arm strength, his leadership. Um, I, I, if you, you if gun to head, I would, I would probably, I would probably say Alabama. I mean, part of me wants to say Texas, but there's just something about Texas that, in the big moment, they just they, they kind of wilt a little bit. I, I don't know that they're ready for the SEC week after week after week. Is even though they're a very attractive team to me, I just those Alabama kids, the ones that stayed. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, players, the best players make plays. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of Jalen Milrow. I'm a big believer in him. And uh, I guess I'd say Alabama. I, I, would, I would probably second that. Um, uh, to, this is going to be a referendum on Texas this year, first year in the SEC. I, I, I want to see it. I'm a Ewers guy. I think Ewers has a chance to be uh, phenomenal this year. All right. Uh, last one. Take Bama, Texas, Ole Miss. Tennessee, obviously Georgia off the board. Give me a dark horse team. Give me somebody who's kind of a breakthrough year, like a Missouri last year that we're not talking about. Like a Missouri this year. Look at their schedule. Look, look at the players they've recruited. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Eli Drinkwitz will actually earn that award this year. I mean, I, you know, but 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 Drink's got to learn how to win, man. I mean, you can't be you know doing stuff at, at it's with handshakes and Josh Heupel. I mean, you you can't do that. You, it's the big time. Um, the SEC is a big time lead. Look, I, I like I like Drinkwitz because he's got personality, right? He kind of reminds me a little bit of the Nutty Professor, right? He's kind of fun. He's kind of an underdog you can cheer for. He's he is a great offensive mind. He is a very good coach. Um, and Missouri has a ton of momentum. And what Missouri has done, in my opinion, is they have figured out what's next. And next is corporate. And you saw they made this change 
Um, and, and Desiree Reed Francois is a fantastic athletic director. I know her personally. She did an unbelievable job there. But from what I understand, and I need to dig a little bit deeper into this. I'm throwing throwing something half out there. Don't like to do that. But I do think this is a big secret, and big key, is they've got some kind of board at the top of this program now. And somehow or another, they're, they're being managed a little differently at the top, right? Different situations call for different strategies. And Missouri has found something. And they are getting uh, the type of money that they need to get the type of players that they need. And they're tapping in from what I'm told, they're tapping into St. Louis and Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And the name of the game, the, the race to the finish, Mike, is who can get corporate sponsorship for their programs. The, you can only squeeze these boosters for so much. These poor guys, every time you go back to them, they got to they got to check their their 401k. They got to take another 10 million from their grandkids. I mean, this is pressing these folks. They're doing everything they can. You're, you're asking fans to put money in a donation bucket. You're asking small businesses to sponsor a player. Uh-uh. You got to get corporate sponsorship. And I think somehow, some way, I think Missouri is on to something. And I don't think they're a dark horse. I think they are absolutely for real. When you were asking me who Georgia might see, uh, Missouri was one of the two or three teams that came to mind first. I think they have tremendous momentum. You, you got to have the momentum. You got to have the hunger. And that program is hungry. You talk about a program that's been stomped on. Um, now, and oh, by the way, Ohio State says thank you very much for beating us in that game because then the Buckeye fans went, what? We lost to who? How much money do you need? Let's grab us this Quinshawn Junkins. Let's get us this Caleb Downs. This is an insult to Ohio State football to get beat by Missouri. And, and, and look at what Ohio State's done. We didn't talk about national. Ohio State, my gosh. Look what they have done. They took Alabama center. They took their best defensive player. They took the best running back out of the SEC on, in a program that's already. But Ohio State, what do they have? Columbus, Ohio, Major League City, big time, second largest city in the state of Ohio. Corporate sponsorship, Mike. That's going to be that's, the key. That goes back to my geography. There are some programs that have inherent advantages geographically and i'm not talking about well this is more tropical climate than the i'm talking about their financial resources and if you have a i mean georgia's got atlanta for crying out loud that's a major major advantage uh some programs have more than others it's just we still are in a have or have nil portal everything it still haves and have nots in college football. I mean, let's stratified, be honest. Though, stratified. The problem is the problem for Georgia that's different than Alabama, and you know this, is it's stratified. You got the Braves. You got the Falcons. You got the right. – you go to Bama, and it, there's either Roll Tide or War Eagle on that license plate. You go to Tennessee, and everything's – the, the traffic barrels, the orange and white, the gold vowels, that, it is the state is about – the Titans are the Titans, but the, the vowels are still the vowels, right? And whereas even in Ohio, you know, Columbus, Ohio – you get into the Midwest, these programs are more stratified. Um, and that's what Georgia's got to do, though. You mentioned Atlanta. I agree. They have to have Atlanta. And it almost sounds like we're, we're plotting some military battle here. They've got to win Atlanta, Mike. they got to hold the line. It's a game there. of risk. <laughs> you, you move your little armies into each of the territories. JC's, though, but the recruiting, dude. I mean, it's like this in recruiting. There's certain areas where certain teams have certain schools and certain ties. And you don't know who's who until you get really deep into it. And why are all these kids from this school going to this school? Because they've won that they've won that territory essentially, and uh, that's that's part of the fun with this too. Let's face it, there's a lot of regionalism still in college football. Yeah, I hope we don't lose that. That's for sure. Griff, uh, great job as always. Keep stirring it up, my man. Uh, keep doing a great job over there at Dog Vent and AJC, and uh, I'm sure we'll see each other down the road. All right, appreciate it, Mike. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, JC. Hey, you thanks, thanks, Mike. Appreciate you, dude. All right, guys. Great. That's Mike Griffith, AJC, Dognet, and uh, we will wrap things up right now. Went a little bit longer, but heck, <laughs> you can just you can just wind him up, let him go, and just it gives us like like what we're looking for. Just talking ball here in April. Just talking ball, JC. We'll keep doing it yeah. each and every week. He's really good. He's right about the perspective that he brings to having covered a lot of different schools and, and things like that. So uh, a lot of respect for him. Good personality is definitely on the, uh, would have a beer list list. Yeah. With me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've known Mike for a while. He's always been really nice uh, and respectful of what, um, I guess what I used to do, the recruiting part of it. Um, and certainly, uh, certainly uh, Georgia fans are lucky. They have a lot of great options uh, as far as people covering their team. And Mike's one of them. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, appreciate everybody tuning in once again. That'll do it for us this week. We'll be back 
next week. Same time, same place. Don't know who we'll have on. It'll be somebody good, whoever it is. That's for sure. Our thanks to Phil Molinax, our producer, the Mad Dog, keeping us technically sound. Our thanks to all our great sponsors and, of course, most of all to you out there for tuning in each and every week. For JC, it's Mike. So long. See you next time.